Good evening. Uh, in its 75 years history, the United Nations has played an indispensable role in resolving major international conflicts and crises, overseeing the distribution of humanitarian aid, and more broadly, advocating for more just and equitable world. It still remains, despite it gets a fair amount of criticism, the most trusted and credible institution in the world. Uh, today, to talk about the UN role uh, in this modern era, when there are conflict on the horizon, and in the backdrop of uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, we have Mr. Shambit Sharp. He is an India UN chief. Uh, Mr. Sharp has devoted more than 25 years of his career uh, promoting exclusive uh, and sustainable development for the United uh, Nations across the world. I welcome you, Mr. Shami Sao. And uh, uh, of course, I begin to ask you uh, uh, fundamentally uh, <clears throat> that the debate is largely on the expansion of the United Nations in its role and in terms of uh, including the larger voice across the world which cuts across your permanent and non-permanent categories under UN Security Council. Uh, would you talk about why the process is so slow uh, and how it is uh, uh, unfolding? Uh, give us a overlook about that, Shami. Well, thank you. <clears throat> First, let me say, Aap sab ko yon house mein swagat hai. Uh, always nice to, to, to see you and have a conversation uh, here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to share thoughts. So, uh, you know, as you've noted, first of all, I would like to just very quickly sort of note that the UN, um, you know, we think of the UN as a monolithic sort of structure. And in reality, you know, it's, it's a somewhat complicated sort of um, aggregation of, of different structures. You've got essentially, uh, you know, on one side, the political structure. And that's, of course, you know, what people have most in mind in terms of the Security Council and, and uh, uh, that level, General Assembly and, and all of that. Um, then you also have the, you know, uh, the de development, humanitarian side, the peace and, and security as well as sort of a third sphere. So in terms of reform, there actually has, you know, the UN has reformed a tremendous amount uh, through its, its life. Uh, but especially in the uh, development and, and humanitarian side of things, we created uh, the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, for example, in the aftermath of refugee crisis stemming from Second World War. Uh, in the beginning, we've uh, you know created a number of different platforms to address crises as they emerge. The UNFCCC, for example, with uh, climate change and, and such. So there has been a tremendous amount of reform. The, the UN Secretary General actually launched the latest uh, series of reforms in 2019, and we've been looking at, uh, at changes really at the headquarters, regional and country level in terms of how the UN system brings its, its um, uh, it, you know, avails synergies and brings its different parts of the house uh, to address developmental challenges primarily. Where there has not been uh, progress is on that political side, the Security Council, absolutely. Uh, there was a, an expansion of the non-permanent members um, uh, many years ago from six to, to 10, but it's very clear uh, most member states agree and certainly the UN Secretary General uh, agrees um, that the Security Council needs to be reformed to reflect the world of today. It was created in the aftermath of, of the Second World War. The number of member states in the UN has uh, sort of more than quadrupled since then. Uh, there's no representation, for example, that, uh, from Africa or from Latin America, uh, not enough representation clearly in, in uh, other regions, Asia, for example. So I think everybody agrees that the Security Council needs to be reformed, needs to be increased to reflect the world as it is today. There is momentum on that. There is a working group process. It has been uh, in place for some years now. But I, I do understand that uh, there are more and more voices aligning uh, for the Security Council to increase, uh, including the, the permanent members. And also, um, if that were to happen, if and when, that I think, I feel, definitely India would be part of that. Now, of course, it's, it's up to the member states, and the Security, uh, Secretary General always reiterates that, and the President of the General Assembly was just here recently in India for a visit, and he reiterates that that's, that's how it works. It's a club of members, so that the members, and especially those with the veto power, the, the P5, right. have to agree. Um, 
the UN staff, let's say, the Secretary General himself and, and others, have no authority uh, in, in that domain. Um, to They can implement decisions, but they don't make the decisions. But just to say that I do think things are moving. There's a realization within the, the, the P5 in particular that change uh, has to come. Um, the legitimacy is, uh, of the organization is dependent on that. And there are a handful of countries that have very, very strong um, uh, arguments and, and, and resumes, let's right. say, to be members of, of this, uh, the permanent Security Council structure, and clearly India is one of those. Uh, Mr. Swamil, uh, well explained, uh, I understand there's a greater intention and desire to expand and uh, include the voices across the world, but the countries and, and the people are, are becoming impatient that certain, certain reforms, and such reforms specific to security councils, are going very slow. And how do you address that? I mean, what can be done? And, and what blocks these, uh, uh, especially uh, when one would like to know uh, how it moves forward, uh, how the group of five people you know, had sort of got that tagline of being elite uh, among you know, uh, a group of people, a group of countries who, who dominate the United Nations, basically. So ultimately, question again, back to you. Uh, what can be done to speed up the process and then how it is done again. Sure. Well, I, again, it's it's um, it's up to the member states. So, what can be done? The most Im important um, action that can be taken is uh, both behind the scenes and and public public lobbying on, uh, in particular, the P five uh, member states to to push forward for reform. I, I should though uh, note that it's it's certainly not just an issue of those P five uh, member states because you have you know essentially two questions. Uh, one is uh, expansion, you know, everyone agrees it needs to take place, but how exactly does it take place? Two, when it does take place, well, okay, who precisely would join uh, in an expanded Security Council? And what authorities would they have? Do you still have um, a veto power, for example? So you, you can imagine if, if uh, uh, the Security Council is not able to act as frequently uh, and as... Um, responsibly uh, always as it maybe should be because of the use of vetoes. Increasing the number of vetoes would even increase uh, the chances of, of uh, getting bogged down in, in those processes. So would you keep the veto? Would you come up with some other type of formulation, a different sort of uh, watered down veto, no veto, this, this kind of a thing? Yeah. Um, these are, are important questions. And certainly, you know, we look at regional groupings. Okay, which countries would represent which, which regions? Um, so there are some, some complications in terms of that calculus um, that are not only uh, just issues of, of, of those uh, P5 uh, agreeing. Regional groupings would need to agree who represents them, for example, in Latin America and Africa, uh, this sort of thing. So, um, but again, there, there is movement for reform. There is a growing kind of realization that it has to happen. For example, the General Assembly uh, recently uh, put in place a requirement um, speaking of the veto, for Security Council permanent members right. to explain to the General Assembly whenever they use a veto. This is something new. It maybe doesn't sound revolutionary, but it's actually quite uh, quite a big step in the direction of, of, um, of reform of the Security Council. So, you know, it's the sort of thing uh, just to say that it, ultimately at the end of the day, it's a political decision of the member states. Um, it's something that we in the UN, certainly the staff, the Secretary General, very strongly support and I think the more that, that countries and, and, and civil society groups uh, lobby for this then um, I think we're moving in the right direction and I'm optimistic at some point in the not too distant future reform will happen. Right. When that does happen uh, clearly India has an incredibly strong I can't think of another country with a better uh, sort of uh, resume to enter the, um, uh, the, the Security Council permanent membership. Right. Uh, uh, Mr. Shomil, before I put this question, you know, I must also put forward uh, uh, that uh, in the recent study uh, conducted by Pew International, which still says uh, across more than 65% of the people you know, with few countries research was done, that UN is still the most credible institution uh, in the world, which has got the institutional acceptance uh, across the world, basically. That remains, mm -hmm. and, and nobody denies the historical uh, and history may constant uh, the amount of work in the human uh, uh, resolving conflicts, managing crisis, and humanitarian that 
UN has done across the world. That's having said that, uh, in the recent times, especially when we talk about the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, there is a significant uh, dent in that credibility. That, that there are the critics who point out basically why did UN fail to address this catastrophe which is taking place now? Uh, ultimately, that's your primary uh, responsibility to uh, absolutely uh, to mitigate such. Uh, in fact, prevent such crisis happening in the international order. What do you say on that? Well, uh, clearly, I mean, the Ukraine um, uh, war in, in Ukraine is is a is a major fail, failure of society of of, of humanity. Uh, it's it's a terrible tragedy and something that uh, uh, certainly everybody wishes could could have and should have been avoided completely senseless. And the Secretary General has has been very clear on that. That there was absolutely no no need no purpose uh, for this war and that should it it should stop and, and cease immediately now there again we see that the challenges of when you have you know security council members with veto power engaged in, in conflict it's um it's 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 simply uh, it's not possible for the un itself to uh to to step in and and, and take active role without the agreement of the member states and in particular when it comes to to, to conflicts the the security council now, I would say that the UN has been working very, very hard. The Secretary General has been working very, very hard on these matters. He was uh, here visiting in India, uh, actually, some some months back in, in October, and I know he was, you know, constantly on the phone with with uh, UN negotiators uh, in in Moscow and Kiev, you know, trying to to seek a resolution. The the um, a ceasefire has been uh, tragically elusive. But at least the UN has managed to achieve very important breakthroughs, the Black Sea Grain Initiative, for example, to open up a uh, supply of, of Ukraine grain, of uh, some Russian uh, as well. This has made a big impact in terms of the availability of food uh, to poor countries, poor communities in the world, has been able to bring down the, the, the price of uh, a lot of the food right. supplies, fertilizers, fuel, these sorts of things. So the UN has played an important role in addressing some of the most critical impacts of the conflict, even though ceasefire in the conflict itself uh, has remained elusive. Um, but I, I would add, we look at the uh, broader picture. Uh, the UN um, has been um, has has been attributed for a um, much of the sort of forty percent decline in, in conflicts that the world has seen uh, since the early nineties. That's through a, a series, a range of different actions of, of peacekeeping, of, of peace enforcing, of peace building. So this international uh, peace and security architecture uh, also plays a very robust role in many different ways, many different forms. Peacekeeping, for example, we've got uh, over 100,000 troops uh, across the world right now, I think in 12 different active peacekeeping missions. And even though they don't always Get, um, uh, they're not always in the spotlight and, and uh, they're not always without failures themselves. They're playing a really, really important role uh, each and every day. And here, India actually has been uh, the largest contributor of peacekeeping troops since the very beginning. So India is recognized as a true leader in terms of supporting UN peacekeeping initiatives, provided the very first all women uh, contingent uh, as well, for example. Yeah. So India has really played an important role in, in that part of, of the UN's efforts. Yeah, Mr. Shomi, you talked about some of the technical uh, aspect of using veto powers and, and that stops resolving the conflict at that level. But that defeats the purpose itself uh, uh, in its primary objective of United Nations you know, to sort of prevent such crisis and even the crisis is on to engage both parties. Uh, and, and you see why I'm asking this question again because after uh, decades we talked about the nuclear war and such things are coming up on the surface. Uh, which is still a very scary thing to talk about and uh, and it's, it's right to ask this question to United Nations itself that uh, understanding the criticality of situation basically and what the steps now being taken are you engaging the both both parties you know uh, bringing them to table and dialogue and when do you see this war uh, with UN effort can be uh, uh, stopped right well uh, I mean, it's, it's certainly, unfortunately, it's impossible to predict when, when the war will stop. Uh, we very much hope it'll stop as absolutely as soon as possible. Um, again, the, the mediation efforts, I mean, the UN has, uh, and the Secretary General has offered 
uh, the, the good offices, uh, his good offices to, to help mediate. Uh, unfortunately, thus far, uh, he hasn't been able to find, uh, you know, the, the um, conditions to do that. But uh, as you mentioned, the UN has been critically important in terms of a range of multilateral international agreements coming together to, to, to mitigate, to reduce uh, the likelihood of various threats of, of mass destruction, mass weapons, the chemical ban treaties, the landmine uh, ban, the uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaties, a, a number of those instruments have been uh, really important. We have, as, as Dag Hammarskjöld, the former um, Secretary General said, uh, you know, the UN was created uh, not so much to keep uh, humanity, uh, take humanity to heaven, but to keep humanity from, from hell. Right. And that it's, it's, a, it's a very, you know, it's an imperfect institution, but it's indispensable. And I think this is very much the point, um, and that's why uh, the Secretary General has spoken out so clearly uh, that these um, any any discussions, any suggestions of of some sort of a nuclearization right. of of any conflict, certainly the conflict in Ukraine, is absolutely a no go. And uh, this is something that cannot be tolerated, cannot be accepted. And so, uh, working you know very very uh, fervently, uh, mostly behind the scenes. To, to try to uh, to help um, bring the parties uh, together. Uh, here again, India is playing such a, a, uh, an important, robust um, leadership role in the geopolitical stage. Uh, increasingly, uh, I think, you, you know, certainly uh, India and other member states like India uh, have important roles to play as well uh, to to try to to bring uh, sides um, across a, a conflict together and to uh, first uh, negotiate a ceasefire and then move from that towards uh, a lasting peace deal. Important that you, you quoted, you know, at least uh, UN uh, it, it, it's, it's sort of a building block that humanity does not go straight away to the hell. It's there is some sort of you know, building block. It's there. You know, Absolutely. And, that's and, and I, I, I should have quoted Prime Minister Modi when he said, this is not an era for war. That's exactly the Absolutely. Sentiment. And then you fill the whole circle. But having said that, you know, I, I again see as a UN uh, be more proactive on some of the geopolitical conflict which you see on the horizon and you talked about you know, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war which is now escalating the proportion you know, it's, it's uh, going out of control and nobody there on the table. The second, uh, as a UN you see globally right, what is happening and another conflict which I see on the horizon is, is on Taiwan basically and as a major player in fact uh, one of the partners is your veto member which you call the security council member. Do you foresee some sort of conflict and do you prepare yourself as an institution to uh, again bring them on the table, start sort of dialogue? And how does it work, you know, uh, within your leadership, uh, Mr. Swambe, if you could just talk about more? Say in the coming conflict, for example, even hypothetically on the Taiwan issue and how you and will uh, work towards that? Well, um, you know, I, I, I should first of all clarify that, that my mandate is, is uh, Development of UN development operations in India. So um, I certainly can't uh, speak with any authority on that. But I, I would just simply, uh, you know, reiterate that that, that um, you know international peace and, and security um, has many different levels. The UN engages in many different levels, many different tools. Um, you know, first of all, the UN is a meeting place for for states to to come together and and to work out their differences. Uh, you know, always yeah. hopefully before uh, conflict erupts. So I, I'm sure that's you know, happening in the halls of, of, of the UN uh, in many different uh, ways that, that, that we often won't, won't hear about. Secondly, the, the UN Department for um, Peace and, and Peacekeeping Affairs, you know, this is, is uh, also the area that, that, that is looking at, uh, of the house that's looking at uh, you know, potential conflicts and, and trying to come up with strategies in terms of, of prevention and, and, and this sort of thing. But um, you know, I, I think the same applies for any potential conflict anywhere. I wouldn't uh, speak specifically uh, on on any um, you know prognosticating uh, any specific uh, future events. But that's the remit of the Security Council. And when member states become concerned about particular hot spots in the world, this sort of a thing, they come together within the Security Council. They ask that Department of uh, uh, Political and, and Peacekeeping Affairs to to advise and, and, and to uh, update and brief and these kinds of things. 
that's where such discussions are, are held. So yeah. I would, uh, you know, of course, we hope that any potential conflict anywhere in the world can be dealt with uh, in, a, in a peaceful manner. That's exactly the, um, the whole purpose of the creation of, of the UN was to learn from the lessons of the Second World War and to try to, going back to Dag Hammarskjöld's quote, to, to prevent that and to be able to chart a path towards peace and prosperity with the development and uh, the humanitarian uh, arms of, of the UN coming into play in, in that regard. Right. Mr. Swami, I will come back to that part, which of course the uh, UN is playing a tremendous role. You know. uh, but uh, one of the question more about the structure of uh, uh, UN, and, uh, it has to go with, as you said, I can take your words, you, know, you, uh, you support multilateralism, you support multiple platforms to represent so many uh, views and crises across the world. You know, It could be from finance and, and it could be geopolitical there. But UN has a large mandate to capture such a, a, a crisis as well, to talk about that, provide solutions. Despite that, we see over the decades, there are, there are multiple uh, pockets of uh, institutions have come up with their own rules and regulations, and they they do play a, a greater part in, in, the, in the conflict. For example, NATO, you're talking about recently the Shanghai uh, SCO uh, Corporation Organization. Uh, I'm talking about the G7 bloc. Mm. Uh, do you see these are the impediments or do you see these are uh, sort of, you know, uh, these complement you, uh, such organization, or, or you see uh, these come out as a result of some of the uh, failures of uh, United Nations? How do you look at it? Look, I, I think, uh, uh, again, this is going beyond my specific uh, remit. But just to echo the words of the um, UN Security, uh, sorry, Secretary General, I won't say all, but you know, most of the, the fact of, of smaller regional groupings of, of member states coming together to, to create platforms where they can uh, discuss issues and, and iron out uh, maybe differences or, or agree on, on paths forward. Uh, are, are, are very much welcomed by, by the UN. So we see that, generally speaking, we see that as, as a very positive uh, development because the UN is, of course, a, uh, that's the big tent. So that's, you know, everybody, the world coming together like that. And you can't always be the, the most nimble and responsive, uh, you know, setup and platform when, when you're the big tent. So having smaller regional groupings, groupings around issues, uh, this sort of a thing is, is very much complementary, and, and the UN uh, is, uh, welcomes that and just seeks to have as much coordination uh, and, and alignment uh, as, as possible. So you see these uh, institutions complement you, you know, in, in resolving conflict and that sure. helping you do a better job. Sure. But, but uh, some of them are, have a high uh, military uh, sort of led orientation, you know, uh, uh, for example, NATO and, and among mm. others. You can see that even the co-op grouping has a sort of you know uh, different way of resolving conflict. It, it's a grouping uh, which is not very defined. Do you think these these are conflict uh, uh, with the with the over, overall goal, goal of UN? Or do you have something to say? You need. Mm. I, I think you know. I, I would of course, uh, as as I meant to differentiate. I mean, I'm speaking more about uh, regional groupings, and right. we've got the well, you, you have the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe (OSCE) got the African Union, you know, you've got the, of course, the EU, I mean, you've, you've, you've got the ASEAN, you know, those, those sorts of groupings, uh, which are very much um, uh, complementary to the efforts of, of, of the UN, more broadly speaking. Uh, I, I wouldn't be talking specifically about military alliances, that's something, you know, quite, quite different. Uh, now, I suppose some, at, at times, there can be alignment, I mean, uh, and, and you just, need to, to look at the, at the record of Security Council resolutions. There are times when uh, you're looking at peace and security, chapter six, chapter seven, have been invoked okay. uh, and have been aligned with efforts of some of those uh, other, uh, even military um, uh, multilateral uh, platforms, but, but that's not a given. So that's something you'd have to really look at, at uh, case by case uh, example and, and see where did the Security Council come with a resolution uh, that sort of um, you know, formalized the relationship and brought the UN system into play at the same time. Uh, Mr. Swambi, uh, I have seen that in your, in your, in your career you know, in the United Nations, you know, majority of work you know, being focused on sustainable development and some of the critical areas of, say, uh, uh, poverty alleviation and all that. I, I come back to uh, 
the core aspect of uh, United Nations and some of the areas which all this have been working and it's in interest of your uh, work. The, the largest number of world poor people you know, live in say Sub-Saharan and then closer South Asia, so about 385 million. Uh, and, 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 and this is the major challenge of your uh, SDG goal. Uh, how does even plan to uh, address it? And is it the funding a problem? And if that, then how do you address that? Sure, uh, absolutely. And, and, and this, um, of course, I mean, the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 agenda, this is the, the kind of the, the lodestar, let's say, for the UN for this period of 2015 to, to, to 2030. And uh, the SDGs, the 17 global goals, we feel are, are absolutely, if, if not more relevant uh, than ever. At the same time, we recognize that we've been in this period of, of what's sometimes called a poly crisis in the last few years. Uh, COVID, the pandemic, global pandemic, which we're still trying to emerge from. And before we could really even, you know, get a solid recovery from that, then the, the, the war in Ukraine came along, of course, with this impact on, on food and, and fuel and, you know, the basic necessities of life. So putting um, uh, a lot of stress on, on poor countries, on, on poor communities, just to put food on the table. And at the same time, driving up the cost of capital, driving up interest rates, uh, putting more and more, I, I, I think something more than half or essentially half of, of developing countries in the world now have been put into either debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. And that's also translated into um, 150 million uh, nearly uh, people that have been pushed into poverty because of this recent poly crisis uh, as well. So we see uh, SDG 1, for example, um, no poverty zero poverty. This has been progress on this goal has been pushed back, we estimate, by four years. Okay. So we've lost essentially four years in, in that regard. And, and, and the risk is great, uh, even greater now that so many countries are at the risk of, uh, you know, uh, debt default or debt distress. We've seen a number of different countries um, succumbing. So I think that, uh, you know, we have to realize that while the SDGs remain absolutely our single best agreed unified set of, of goals they're facing unprecedented challenges and so we have to come up with new ways uh, to you know to re-energize and, and, and scale up uh, our response so there there are a number I, I would also add for the very first time ever uh, the human development index that UNDP runs uh, has seen um, uh, you know declines in HDI uh, measures across most countries for the last two years since the very beginning of, of the metric this is the first time that, that that's happened so what can we do about that well definitely uh financing and so two things capacity Sorry. and financing are, are the most important so this actually is the the reason why the secretary general has launched um his sdg stimulus plan a call for an sdg stimulus plan um now this is very very important at the moment why because um, whereas the higher income countries have been able to uh, support their economies, support their people, provide social security assistance through stimulus plans, through either monetary or, or fiscal means uh, within their countries, poor countries have not been able to do that. So we need a, a global stimulus plan mm -hmm. around the SDGs. And this is articulated, there are a number of, of different actions articulated in, in this plan. Um, it's, it calls for $500 billion a year uh, additional funding uh, to achieve the SDGs. It also aligns well with uh, what's, um, and I should say, against the backdrop of all of these, we have the greatest existential threat of all, the climate crisis, actually triple planetary crisis. Right. So it's biodiversity loss, pollution, and climate change. Now, this stimulus plan, this $500 billion, also uh, calls for a reform of the international financial architecture. So reform of multilateral development banks. Uh, the World Bank, for example, all, is already in the process of developing a, a kind of a, a, a roadmap for how it can possibly reform. So, you know, essentially what we need is a significant increase in the amount of capital provided to poor countries and poor communities to meet uh, this, this poly crisis to meet the ongoing existential crisis of, of climate change, um, to address uh, adaptation issues. Uh, this aligns also well with what's been coming out of the COP, um, UNFCCC COP 
process, uh, the loss and damage fund, for, for example, recognizing that um, poor countries who by and large did not create the problem are paying the greatest price at right. this moment. Here in India, we, we, we see, you see the impact um, of uh, you know, um, heat waves and, and floods and cyclones and, and all of these things. We had the hottest February on record recently. So all of this is coming together. I see that there are a number of, of stars aligning in a way. So you have the SDGs, uh, the, the SGs, SDG stimulus plan. You have the, the Bridgetown uh, initiative coming out from Prime Minister Barbados. You have uh, the President Macron's uh, initiative as well, together with the Barbados Prime Minister. And very importantly, you have India's G20 presidency. Right. This India's G20 presidency is coming at the perfect time. Perfect meaning, I mean, it's a very challenging time. It's maybe the most challenging time. But it, uh, the, S, the um, G20 uh, summit will happen literally right before the global SDG summit at the General Assembly in September, which is the midterm. We're halfway to the 20 to 2030. So this is where we will stop take, say, where are we? What's going well? What's going wrong? Much of it's going wrong, right? But India's G20 presidency will essentially handshake and India's uh, SDG, uh, G20 SDG acceleration action plan that India is working on will be sort of perfectly uh, positioned to drive the conversation at the global summit as well. And you know, just another uh, thought on that point, not only is the timing really incredibly um, uh, important of India's G20 presidency, but the fact that India is president of this G20 is also incredibly important because India is in a way uniquely positioned to bring countries together across divides, across disagreements, uh, because India has such um, a great amount of, of relationships, of legitimacy, uh, of, of bridges of trust across every dimension, north, south, east, west, G7, G77, uh, voice of the global south. So I have great um, hope and, and I'm optimistic that India will be able to uh, right the ship of the G20, despite all of this uh, kind of tempest. Uh, we were at the Ricina Dialogue uh, just just recently, and it was kind of you know branded slogan is lighthouse in the tempest. Right. And I do think that India's G20 presidency is a lighthouse in the tempest. It's what we need right now. Um, it's very very difficult, but I think that we will be able to. India will be able to deliver very important results just in time for the uh, global SDG summit in September. I think very interesting you uh, talked about the SDG uh, stimulus and, and that yet to be seen how it's unfolding, but this is a very critical aspect to you. Uh, but I would like to broaden my question a bit, especially uh, in the context of India. And um, and since also your work uh, talks about that in, in terms of the uh, poverty alleviation and all that, despite India has succeeded taking uh, millions out of the abject poverty, there are uh, some about, even the UNDP report talks about some about the uh, 230 million, uh, uh, in, in fact, India had the world's uh, highest number of poor at 230 million. What is lacking you know, uh, in terms of you know, policy response and, and economic growth? And you see it's more of a uh, understanding which of more. And your perspective, yeah. I want uh, you to explain on this. You know, are we going the right direction? Mm -hmm. In a way, uh, there's a growth, is inclusive or, or it is uh, exclusive? But how, how, you, how do you see it? India is evolving in terms of uh, embracing such values, embracing such challenges. Right. So um, I think, first of all, I w I w you mentioned the, uh, the UNDP uh, MPI, the Multidimensional Poverty uh, Report. And, and there, I think what's, what's important uh, to understand and to note is that in the last uh, about uh, 18 years or so, India has made significant achievements in terms of, of poverty reduction. So according to the MPI, uh, multi-dimensional poverty index, which is looking at not, not just uh, income-based measures, but looking at you know, access to clean cooking fuels, housing, water and sanitation, uh, you know, these sort of things, mobile connectivity and, and such. Um, the number has been reduced dramatically from 55% to, to about 16%, um, uh, give or take slightly. And so that's a really, really important um, movement in the right direction. This has come on the back of uh, critical uh, major flagship programs, missions, government missions, and 
you know, we're all very familiar with Jal Jivan, with Swatch Bharat, yeah. with um, very, very important social safety nets the, uh, uh, for food and food security, the food security law, actually, which is a, a rights-based law, which is quite uh, progressive in, in the world, uh, the targeted public distribution system, midday meal, uh, the, um, the, the, the community health centers, district level community health centers. There's really, uh, you know, a number of, of very important development achievements that India has uh, not only uh, been able to demonstrate at scale, but are increasingly becoming, in a way, best practices that we here, the UN and India, are helping to, to sort of identify, uh, codify, and take to the international level as well, to, to share increasingly India's best practices at, at the international level. We look at um, uh, digital sphere, for example, I mean, absolutely incredible uh, things happening here in, in India. The digital public infrastructure is incredibly advanced. I mean, wor world leading, in fact, payment systems, uh, the um, uh, COVID response, for example, COVID vaccination, over 2.2 uh, and counting uh, billion uh, vaccines have been delivered. And that's why, because of the digital infrastructure there, the COVID program that the UN has, has supported, UNDP and, and, and others, and WHO and, and UNICEF and such, um, digital financial inclusion. So if I'm not mistaken, there's something like, um, you, you look at digital payments on more than sort of China and, and the US combined every day here in India. That has been an important factor to bring in uh, marginalized populations, to bring in women in particular. I've had a wonderful experience with uh, the SEVA organization and hearing about how um, there are two, two million, I think, women uh, members, you know, micro, small entrepreneurs and, and self-help group members have all digitalized. They're all digitally banked now. So this was a, an example of taking a, uh, a challenge, taking the, the COVID crisis and turning it uh, in a way into an opportunity. Now, um, that's not to say that there aren't big challenges remaining. There absolutely are. I mean, inequality remains uh, a serious challenge here in India. Uh, there, there are, um, according to uh, Ministry of, uh, of Statistics, we work with the Ministry of Statistics, we work with Niti Aayog uh, on a number of different uh, SDG uh, indi indicator platforms. We have actually India has embraced the SDGs um, as a as an analytical tool and framework more than any other country that I've seen. We have the uh, India SDG Index, which is a fantastic tool that that kind of uh, captures uh, for management comparative purposes performance across all of the states and then in uh, down at the district level in certain areas. And you, you see that the states really look at this, uh, these data sets and say, well, we're doing well in this area, um, but that state's doing better in that area. How can we learn from them? And that's part of NITI's, uh, NITI IOG's mandate. We work with them, support them uh, on, on that as well. So, you know, that is to say, according to, to those data sets, there are still big challenges. I would say um, nutrition uh, certainly is one, uh, gender equality is another. Uh, that's where the uh, Prime Minister's women-led development initiative is, is very, very important uh, here in India too. Sure. So, you know, how do we, um, uh, how, how do we really uh, leverage this, this momentum, uh, especially in the digital sphere, where India is increasingly, in a way, leapfrogging over uh, many other countries in terms of uh, development progress. And uh, again, the G20 is, is a place where India is bringing some of these examples um, yeah. and offering to, to other countries in, in the world. Uh, just green transition as well, I would mention, is, is truly important uh, here in India. Um, the private sector, Indian private sector, is investing huge amounts of resources, so a couple hundred billions of, of dollars in uh, renewable energy. Uh, some of the cheapest uh, solar energy in the world can be found here in India. Investments in renewable uh, right. uh, electric vehicles. Mr. Swami, here you raised a, a, yeah. a critical point, and which uh, I would like to be more focused on, mm -hmm. especially on the, on the climate change. And uh, this often the debate goes in the direction between the fossil fuel and the green energy. It, it's about the climate financing, which is mostly uh, uh, from the developing countries, uh, and they demand more climate finance for the transition uh, towards the green energy. Uh, how does the UN look at? Uh, this transition and especially in the funding part again uh, for the smooth the transition you know and, and how you uh, facilitating yes so um ab absolutely and, and and this is this is something where i think the uh, uh the un's priorities and 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 india's priorities 
are, are very, very much uh, aligned and, and, you know, kind of rowing in, in, in the same direction there. So clearly we need a just green transition, but the just green transition, unfortunately, can't yet be just green in the sense of only green, mm -hmm. right? It has to be just green in the sense of fair and green. Uh, it's simply a fact that for many developing countries, they will still require to, to provide, to meet the uh, rights of citizens to development, they will still need a mix, an energy mix. And so the task at the moment is to increase the, the renewable share of that mix. But unfortunately, as much as we wish we could, we can't just jump to 100% renewable, unfortunately, at, at the moment. So it's about pushing uh, fast forward as, as much as possible on increasing the, the, the mix in renewables. And here, India is making um, incredible, has made incredible commitments. Uh, the Prime, Prime Minister Modi's uh, Panchamrit commitments at, at COP26, um, 500 gigawatts of re renewable energy, something, you know, 50% of a renewable mix in, in the energy mix, uh, all by 2030. This is critically important, and it, it requires a whole of society sort of um, approach. So obviously, the private sector plays a, a huge role in that. Uh, and here, India, as I was just mentioning, um, uh, you know, electric mobility is, is an incredible uh, opportunity, market opportunity here. Solar power, renewable power, green hydrogen, you know, these are, are incredible. If I were an investor right now, I'd, I'd want to be jumping into the renewable uh, uh, industry here in India at the moment. And we have a lot of good, you know, UN has a lot of good uh, partnerships uh, with Indian private sector. With Renew Energy, for example, UN Environment Program, working together with Seva and Gujarat, to help train women salt pan workers in, in the round of Kutch to change their employment uh, livelihoods, to upgrade their livelihoods, to become solar engineers, to learn how to repair uh, solar panels, to take advantage of this you know, huge growth in, in the solar industry uh, here. Now, but let me say in terms of the financing, this is critically important. And this is where COP, uh, the COP process, countries of the world have come together and said, look, we made at Paris, the countries made a pledge, the, the high income countries made a pledge for 100 billion a year. That still hasn't materialized. Now we need a trillion dollars a year. So it's critically important for the high income countries to step in. And that links precisely to the SDG stimulus plan of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Secretary General, which calls for the interna international financial architecture to be reformed. So how do we get that trillion dollars? How do we get that money flowing? The development banks, first of all, need to increase their leverage dramatically, right. inject uh, significantly greater amounts of capital. Secondly, we need to, um, to, to crowd in a significantly higher amount of private capital in that. So this 500 billion uh, that the SG is calling for, that should yield trillions of dollars of private capital coming in and blended finance and and different types of, of models like that. So this is important. The COP27 uh, on financing the um, uh, agreement on a loss and damage fund was a very important milestone. To uh, It has to be funded still, but to provide those communities in poor countries and poor communities and countries that are already losing life and, and uh, suffering a lot of damages from inclement weather impacts and other climate uh, related uh, damages, for them to have uh, funding for recovery and for resilience. Um, here, India is leading on the uh, Coalition for Disaster uh, Resilient Infrastructure. You know, that's exactly the kind of uh, leadership that the world needs. Right. On the adaptation side, uh, financing, bringing finance to uh, the Global South, to uh, developing countries. At the same time as the mitigation side, and here India supports the International Solar Alliance, which also, you know, is about bringing finance for, for climate uh, mitigation efforts. Right. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Sean Misaf, India, UN chief on the range of issue. That will be definitely for the humanity. And in the era to come, UN is to play a greater role. Let's watch out. This is Manish Kumar Jha from Financial Express with cameraman, Mr. Hilal. Thank you. Bahad Thank you.